Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Joan Roughgarden. Uh, I've known of Joan for quite a while. Uh, I guess we are indirectly related in that she was my ecology master's thesis postdoctoral advisor. And I'm now uh, starting a project next week with one of her former students. And um, she's an absolute superstar uh, in, the, in the world of biology. And she's now an adjunct professor with the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. And in the last couple of years, uh, she's been using economic models uh, to look at features of animal behavior. And that's why she wanted to uh, come and meet with our department today and give it a, 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 a seminar today. And she's hoping to pique the interest of both the faculty and grad students in terms of projects that she's hoping to work on in the future. So please join me in welcoming Joan. Uh, thank you so much for the very kind introduction. And I have to say, it's a, I'm overjoyed to be giving a seminar in a location where there's no time zone difference. <laughs> and uh, some of you know I now live in Kauai, and I retired from Stanford two and a half years ago, but I found that I couldn't stay retired. It was just impossible. After three months on the beach, I just couldn't take it anymore. And when I was... When I first retired, I found that it was very disorienting, and I had grand plans of writing a novel, or I didn't know what I was going to do, and what am I doing? I find that I'm writing papers and giving lectures, and I just, it's in my blood. So, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to discuss what I've just been working on. So, what I'll be talking about right here is... Uh, some modeling that I did on animal about animal behavior during the summer and uh, and in the early fall, and I just wrote up this paper uh, last week because I emailed uh, Katya and, and some others here, and you said you wanted a paper, and I've been planning on giving this in February, so I <laughs> gathered together my notes and put, put this together. So all of this is brand new and hasn't been um, vetted by. Uh, nice rigorous peer group such as yourselves. And so here's where I'm coming from, uh, as, you'll, as you'll see in more detail. Uh, the, the premise I'd like to explore is that uh, we can use the economic theory of the firm to help understand better how animal social groups are organized. And the premise here is that animal social groups uh, are the, the premise, it's, a, it's a hypothesis that they can be considered as firms, so to speak, whose product is offspring. And, and if that's true, then the theory of, this, of the firm might offer us some clues as to how a firm, or as to how an animal social group could be efficiently structured and built around incentives that would lead to the maximization of offspring output. And of course, if a group does produce the maximum number of offspring, we would expect that that organization would slowly evolve through natural selection. And there are many questions that are asked about the theory of the firm that seem to be exceedingly relevant to us in, in biology. For example, the question of why does a firm exist? Well, that would be similar to the question of why does a social group exist? Why aren't animals all individuals? Why do they work in groups? And uh, so in the course of the summers, I started reading about the theory of the firm and working little exercises. The first big topic that I came to was the principal agent problem in the theory of the firm. And it seemed to me as though that problem could be adapted quite readily to the phenomenon of so-called courtship feeding and nuptial gifts. And I'll show you some slides about what that is. And uh, so what I have to offer here is not new theoretically. Uh, it represents, a, uh, if you will, a technology transfer from thinking in the, from elementary thinking in economics into uh, biology. And perhaps it's an indication of a great deal more that could be done of the same sort. Now, um, there, t the two phrases, nuptial feeding and uh, uh, sorry, courtship feeding and nuptial gifts 
are used more or less interchangeably, but there's a somewhat contextual difference, as you'll see. Um, birds, in particular, have a lot of nuptial, a lot of courtship feeding. The, the ornithologists tend to use the phrase courtship feeding. The entomologists tend to use the phrase nuptial gifts. So here you see two woodland birds, uh, and the male is feeding seeds to the female. Here's another case of the northern cardinal, and I show this particularly because this is easy to see here. I'm not sure if this is true on Oahu, but certainly on Kauai, we have a lot of these birds, and we can see this quite readily on our lanai, where the male uh, feeds the female right here. And it, so it could be easily studied here in the Hawaiian Islands in more detail. And here's another picture that I have just because it's a great picture. <laughs> and you can see this tern feeding uh, another adult tern. So these are adults feeding adults. These are not adults feeding nestlings, anything of that sort. So this is the phenomenon of uh, courtship feeding. And in the little paper that I've uh, prepared for you, there's, there are more references about this phenomenon. And there's, it, it's quite well known. That is to say, there are dozens, many dozens of species for which it's been documented. But there are also many dozens of species that are well studied in which it doesn't occur. And so one question, of course, is why does it occur? And what's the extent of it? And with respect to birds, the courtship feeding uh, often begins prior to the eggs being laid, while the female is busy producing the eggs. And then... It continues through the time that the female is sitting on the eggs, incubating them and bringing them up to a warm temperature so that they can develop. And then it stops after the, uh, eggs, are, the eggs are fledged, the, the hatchlings are produced. And, and, uh, but sometimes the feeding continues while the hatchlings are still in the nest, but prior to fledgling. Now, it's also the case that sometimes the male is feeding the female when only the female is sitting on the eggs. But there are also some species in which the, females, the, the males feed the females, even though he himself also incubates the eggs some of the time. So as you can see, there's quite a bit of variation in the expression of this phenomenon. So therefore, any model about this phenomenon would have to indicate conditions under which all sorts of uh, various expressions occur. Now, this is courtship feeding, or nuptial gift giving in insects. And again, the, the handout has the, the, these two photographs in here. These are uh, flies right here, wrapped around the corner. And here, uh, the male, which is this fly right here, brings a bug or a bug wrapped in silk, or something of that sort, and brings it to the female. And here's a bug right here, here's a, a prey item. And the female actually consumes the item while the male is mating. So this would be called, they use the phrase, nuptial gift for this. And the sense of it is that the, the, that the gift, the gift, so to speak, is being consumed solely during the time the mating is occurring. It's not associated with additional parental care. So the ornithologists, on the one hand, tend to view the courtship feeding as leading to the production of more young. And because the male is siring those young, the male benefits indirectly by having the, the, male, by having the female produce more young that he has, in fact, sired. So that's so-called paternal investment. Whereas this, it's, it's imagined here that, that the male is monopolizing uh, the female during the time of courtship right here, and he's able to prolong the copulation uh, by giving the female food. And so here, the, the entomologists tend to view the uh, nuptial gift as a device to maximize the mating success of the male, to increase the amount of time that the male, the male monopolize the female, or, uh, and prevent other males 
from uh, mating at the same time. Now, in uh, bush crickets or katydids, the male uh, gives a large uh, s uh, structure which has partly sperm in it and partly nutritious material. And the, this is given to the female. Um, and, and the female then consumes the, the nutritious material at the same time that the sperm are released and somehow um, are brought into um, contact with the eggs. Now, there are a couple cases, particularly in katydids, in which labeled, uh, co labeled compounds from here are actually found deposited within the female's body and later within the female's eggs. So that there's a possibility that these nuptial gifts actually do increase the fertility of the female. So the people working in this area are busy arguing about whether the nuptial gift is used solely for mating success or whether it's used for mating success plus increased fecundity. Okay? So that's the phenomenon. And there are many groups of insects in which this is very widespread. So the, the question that, the, this, that this phenomenon raises to me is, is that we have, a, or we can be thought of as having a principal agent problem right here, where the principal is the female, and the female uh, is in a position to lay eggs and the male has to either uh, convince the female to mate with him in the first place, and or the, the, the male can, through his efforts, increase the productivity of the female. And this would be similar to a principal agent problem in the theory of the firm, in which the owner of the firm has to hire an employee, and the action of the employee leads to an increase in the, in the profit of the firm. So the logic to the way in which I've been modeling this is uh, twofold right here. Typically in behavioral ecology, the uh, models of animal behavior are posed with the logic that's in gray here. That is, um, it's envisioned that uh, the females have, or, or the, the, the agents have genetic strategies, and a an equilibrium is found between the genetic strategies, which is called an evolutionarily stable strategy by John Maynard Smith, and is uh, an evolutionary counterpart of the Nash non-cooperative equilibrium. And so, the typical way in which to to do evolutionary game theory is to imagine <coughs> that you have uh, strategies that come to a natural equilibrium here, and then you try to figure out how that would be manifested in the behavior that the animals express. And I've been advocating now for several years that we really shouldn't be using that logic. It's not very helpful, and instead we should use bottom-up logic, which is more the way we would do it in population biology, where instead of modeling the population dynamics in terms of classic equations like the logistic equation. For many years now, we've been building up to population dynamic models based on uh, the mechanisms of individuals. So that's what we ought to do here, is to take a bottom-up view as well. And instead, uh, we can model the behavior on a day-to-day -day basis, and then accumulate the day-to-day -day activity to yield the fitness which you then use in a population genetic or evolutionary model. So I would uh, model the behavior to begin with and then uh, scale up to its implications for the gene pool. So you'll see that the notion of profit that I have, what is the female trying to do on any given day? What she's trying to do is maximize her fitness increment for the day. And similarly, the male will be trying to maximize his fitness increment. And then you sum up the increments over all the days of the breeding season, and you come out with the animal's fitness, which you would in turn use in an evolutionary model. 
So we have a fine scale behavioral uh, model nested within a slower uh, evolutionary model. And the second aspect of the logic right here, it doesn't come in quite so much in this talk as in some of the other papers I've written, but it's typical in thinking about behavior, tracing back to Darwin, really, to, to view the mating stage as the key stage in the reproductive cycle. So the idea is that, uh, in fact, you didn't find this in something like Gary Becker's work on, the, on marriage and on sorting, and where you try to find the best mate, and then you let the offspring take care, um, follow from whatever the mating was. But in life history theory and biology, we, we argue the other way around. We talk about uh, the situation at the end of the life, and then figure back, work backwards, through backward induction to when reproduction ought to begin in order to maximize the output at the end of the season. And I think similarly that we should be using backward induction to understand the mating dynamic. We should look at the terminal condition at the end of the breeding season and find out what it is that you would need to do to maximize the number of offspring at that point, then work back to mating and find out that and understand mating dynamics as what you need to do to set up the infrastructure within you from which you get the maximum number of offspring at the end. So the way in which and the logic with which you would analyze uh, behavior, animal behavior, is um, up for discussion. Can now, I ask you something? Yeah, that? sure. Um, so we could imagine an intermediate stage between behavior and evolution being the institution of nuptial feeding, or is that institution is the behavior? Where that institution is, is okay. the behavior. There's no separate behavior. Correct. Yeah. So I haven't behavior. subdivided behavior into individual behavior, into yeah. individual group, but you use the word institution maybe deliberately because it would be nice, I think, to think of the animal behavior, animal behavior, and animal social customs as constituting an institution. Okay. And, uh, um, now, a principal agent model, this is just a textbook principal agent model. And on the, uh, on the top up there, WF is the fitness increment, that is for one day, uh, for a female. And that's taken as being the nuclear gift, plus the courtship feeding. And operationally, I'm distinguishing between the nuclear gift and the courtship feeding as uh, follows. I think this is consistent with the usage that the bird people and the insect people have, but it's a little more precise. Uh, and the nuptial gift I'm in, imagining is what the male gives the female so that a mating will take place. So it's prior to the initiation of the relationship. And uh, then the courtship feeding is the feeding that takes place once there is a relationship. So in this scheme right here, the female gets the nuclear gift, and then uh, if there is in fact a relationship, she also receives the courtship feeding. And, but she reimburses the male for the courtship feeding. Right here. So this is what the, the male, this is what the female pays the male with a constant, the coefficient of proportionality right here. So this is in units of incremental number of eggs provided by the nuclear gear, incremental number of eggs provided by the courtship feeding, loss of eggs due to, say, time spent by the female um, uh, that could not be spent in other activities, and in that time, that very time is used by the male to increase the number of sires he makes. So this is where the male benefits from the reimbursement. And then the, this is the male's effort, which is taking, he's having to go out and catch food to do the nuclear feeding, the, the courtship feeding. So this is then the cost term. Uh, and the following uh, minus c squared, because this was the, uh, uh, frankly, this is the formula in the book sites, in the book sites looking at, but you could take other forms. And then this is the cost of the nuclear gift. 
which is given to the male, the female. And this is the female's outside option, and then this is the male's outside option. And the female's always uh, able to produce offspring on her own due to her own foraging, so she doesn't need all this. And the male, on the other hand, has to spend all his time doing the foraging right here. And so what he gets from that has to exceed what he could do with his outside option, which is to find some other female to mate with that doesn't require any feeding. So that's the basic setup, which I think is probably pretty familiar to all of you. And then here's the analysis. Um, now, the, uh, the, one, the usual solution concept that we would have in, a, in biology would be this, the, uh, the Nash equilibrium, or what I'm calling here the Nash competitive equilibrium. And so what you do is you simply solve, as you know, for the uh, optimal feeding rate by the male, take the optimal feeding rate by the male given its compensation, that, that, that's M, plug that into the formula for the female, and then maximize uh, over M to get the maxim to get the best feeding rate to get to get the best compensation rate from the female, and then uh, and then under those conditions you could take the gift to zero. So this so this is uh, the equilibrium, which would be the Nash competitive equilibrium. And um, you know that's not necessarily the most efficient. So if you also solve for the, uh, the compensation rate that leads to the largest sum of the fitness increments from both parties, you get this curve right here. So this is the total excess fitness. Now this is interesting um, because this would then provide a rationale for the gift. Now if the if the male doesn't give any gift at all, it could potentially, using these numbers right here for this graph, um, and when you're using mathematically, you need numbers to get graphs, so that's why there are numbers. <laughs> so if you used, uh, with these numbers, if you had, a, had no gift at all, then, and you had the most efficient compensation rate, then the male could get a half. And so between a half and what it would get at the Nash equilibrium, you have an A, so it's a half minus an eighth will give you three eighths. So it has three eighths to play with, with which it could then um, pay as a side payment to the female to induce the female to uh, increase her compensation rate so that it was the most efficient compensation rate. So the male, uh, on the other hand, has to give uh, I mean, the female won't go for it unless the male gives at least a gift of a quarter because that is what the female would be making anyway. So unless he, he gives at least uh, an amount of a quarter, she won't play ball. On the other hand, he can't give more than three-eighths because then he would come out worse than he would. So between this point and this point, we have the interval of the gift that the male could get to give to the female and come out ahead of both himself and the female will come out ahead of, ahead of herself. So this is a win-win interval right here. And furthermore, you can compute the Nash bargaining solution. And it's on this line right here, which actually splits the difference. And that would be uh, uh, at least one possible definition of a, a good compromise. So that raises the question of whether it's reasonable to imagine that these two animals could uh, negotiate their way to some point on the efficient, on the efficient frontier right here, and in particular, they could negotiate their way to a Nash bargaining solution. So I've suggested that there is a mechanism, uh, and it involves physical intimacy between the animals and the social role or the adaptive role of physical intimacy. So now here's a phenomenon that 
but again, just cries out for an explanation, which is how much physical intimacy there is between animals. Animals do not live solitary lives. And they're not just sort of in one another's uh, area. Very often, they're very touchy. But here's a family group. Everyone's touching one another. He's touching the primates. Here's a case of to, uh, here's a, a, a mating going on. And a lot of the species of bonobos here, particularly in, in, some, in some species where there is, in fact, a lot of cooperation observed, there's a huge amount of physical contact, often sexual contact, but not necessarily sexual contact. You've probably seen animals uh, prune each other's uh, fur, looking for little bugs, you've seen maybe birds prune each other's feathers. And animals are having fun when this is happening. And I've been suggesting that animals uh, can sense each other's welfare uh, and th through this mechanism, and that through experiencing the, phys the pleasure of intimate physical contact, they can um, act jointly to maximize their joint fitness. And let me show you one other slide right here, which is of, a, of, a, uh, of two lions, two same-sex lions mating. It's a very interesting case, this little clip. So this one lion approaches another, nuzzles it, and invites... So you see, they're both, they're both males, so they have the lion's mane, and invites a mating. And that sort of thing goes on also quite a bit in nature. Now, there's nothing stressed about this. This is uh, the kind of thing which could lead to the... Uh, and there would be others, but I'm saying that physical in the shared pleasure of phys physical intimacy is a device by which animals could actually sense each other's welfare and approach a more efficient solution than they otherwise would have. Um, now, of course, they could bargain through alternating offers and all kinds of schemes of that sort that Rubenstein and others have talked about for many years. But I don't think it's necessary to view attaining a, a, a bargaining solution as requiring individual antagonistic interactions. It seems to me that the behavior is consistent with the naturally uh, reaching solutions like a Nash bargaining solution, let's say, um, uh, cooperatively. The behavior itself is cooperative, not just the outcome. All right, now, just moving along here, these are some of the other cases. If the female does have an outside option, then the whole graph just moves vertically. Something particularly interesting here. And if the male has an outside option, uh, the plot thickens somewhat. Uh, here, if the, the outside option is larger than what the male would get at the national competitive equilibrium, then in order for the female to get the relationship at all, she has to pay the male. So you would actually have a negative gift here, which would give you this as the threat point. With this new threat point, you get a shift in the match party solution down to there. So uh, if animals can't reach the efficient uh, frontier here, then you would expect cases in which the males are paying the females. And, 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 sorry, in which the females are paying for males, which would be the equivalent of a dowry, so to speak, instead of a bride price. Now, the um, so this is the picture of what might happen in one day. And then the question arises of whether or not the the relationship would continue. Now, uh, ornithologists use the word divorce when describing bird a bird pair that breaks up midway in the breeding season. And, and that in the paper that I've given you, I've included some references to, to this. The most, the, the clearest result that comes out of the data on bird divorces is that they occur much more frequently 
in species in which there's a high annual mortality rate. And if there's a low annual mortality rate, such as in the albatrosses and the seabirds around here, then the divorce is very rare. But in something like those songbirds that I showed you in the very first slide, they're, they're in England, there's a lot of mortality with the woodland birds in the, in the high temperate zone, and so you might, the average lifespan might be a year or two. So that there'd be a high mortality rate, and there's also a high divorce rate. And so, I, and I don't know of any information about the counterpart of the divorce rate for insects. I don't know if that concept would be well defined for insects. Now, of course, a familiar argument then for whether or not the pairing should continue would be to look at uh, the costs and benefits of continuing the relationship or defecting and, um, and absorbing uh, the punishment from defecting. So I'm calling right this, this here the temptation for the female in this case to continue, the temptation to defect or to divorce. And it would simply be to accept both the nuclear gift and the courtship feeding and her outside offer, right, but not to reimburse the male. So this is equation one, but without paying the male back for everything that you've done. The, the, the penalty, if you will, is that in the future, so the female can do that only once and get away with it, thereafter, all the female can get is just her outside option. And meanwhile, the benefit to the female is this expression, which um, is simply her, her um, earnings at the match volume of the solution. So that's what she would get if she goes along with the benefit of the new parent. And so, uh, given an infinite time horizon for the moment, that means that if she does do a divorce, if she gets her temptation, but and L is the probability of living to a living to, for a day, for, till the next day. So, so she gets the temptation once, but if she, then she lives the next day and just gets the penalty and so on. You just add that up and you get this is the expected fitness over the season of. Um, continuum of uh, divorcing. And then this is the benefit, this is the expected fitness over the season of continuing to cooperate, which is the benefit now, and then she gets this every consecutive day. So as you know, we'll just compare then this expression with that expression and come up with a threshold daily survival for continued pairing. And so the survival has to be greater than this expression if the pairing is to continue. If the uh, survival is less than that expression, then you'd expect a divorce. And in the manuscript, I've computed, uh, I've repeated this argument, but also from the male's point of view, because you can compute what uh, the minimum survival would be for the male to stay part of the relationship as well as the minimum survival for the female to stay part of the relationship. And if they both, if the actual survival is greater than the threshold for both sexes, <coughs> then the uh, relationship would, would continue. And then the party that initiates the divorce would be the one that has the most stringent uh, requirement, which in the case of the numbers, the, the numerical values I was using happen to be the male. So the male would be the first one to, uh, in, to implement the divorce. And, and the way they would implement, the way um, a, a female would implement the divorce is that she would just not pay the male for, for the food he had given her. The way a male would uh, um, implement a divorce is that he would give a fake item of food to the female. And you'll also see in the manuscript that noted citations where that's been observed, where instead of the male going out and actually getting a real insect and giving it to the female, who gives her um, some little uh, a little piece of straw or something. And uh, so all, all the female has to be, <laughs> just be fed something which is worthless, and that will also initiate a divorce. So John, on yeah. the case of divorce, um, 
Did you assume that if a female or a male be there, sure, they're going to st stay alone forever? Yeah, or, and then or they've got to other parties. They would try what, to, what do they have to do with that? Uh, or, but no, those two stay divorced. Those two stay divorced and they yeah. have divorced forever. Right? Yeah, so and, and those two are divorced forever. Yeah. yeah. So you don't have to account that. So right. Potentially maybe it's like yeah, that, no, so it's not a population level model. It's a, a model just defined at the level of these pair of individuals. You know? It's a within a small group. The group is embedded within a larger species. So it would take, you'd have to then add up over all the different individuals and all the different groups and so on to get a population model out of it. And I have not done that in this case. So it's a small <laughs> subset of the population. But that does bring me to the next, yeah, to the to the next slide, which is the next to last slide. So I, I did want to call your attention to the fact that people in my lab though have been modeling also <coughs> at the population scale. So this is a paper with their Alache, um, in which we looked at the evolutionary dynamics of payoff indices. So in this case, we imagine the genotype that is coded for by the A2 gene. And in A2, A2 homozygote is assumed to have this kind of payoff matrix for being being played against another individual with the same genotype. And then you get a slew of other game of uh, payoff matrices for other pairings and other matchups of A of heterozygotes against one another, homozygotes, and so on. And if you do that, you can write down in the way that population geneticists do uh, an equation for the gene frequency in the population at time t plus 1 as a function of what it was at time t. And these numbers right here in the sums of rows and columns of the payoff matrices weighted by the frequencies in the population. So in this way, you can actually get a population genetic model for the evolution of the payoff matrix from looking like that to looking like that. And in a picture of, of a, a payoff thing, the population went from, from having this to having that. So there's a whole uh, research uh, component to our program which has looked at the genetical dynamics. <coughs> But from my perspective, I have to say that this is not as interesting as the behavioral dynamics because we've explored population genetic models now for the last 50, almost 100 years. And since the, the early part of the 1900s. It's not 100 years yet, but it's, it's well over 50 now. And I'm not as engaged by any more population genetic modeling. What seems to me to be much more interesting is to import into biology modeling, which is done at the behavioral scale, uh, and, and to, in, to entertain concepts such as those of the theory of the firm. Now, the last slide is quite unabashedly a commercial. <laughs> so this is, these are, <coughs> This is a book I wrote in the mid, uh, in around 2005. It's called Evolution Serene Mode. And it's now been translated into Korean and Portuguese and Brazil. And this is one that came out a couple of years ago, the Gene and Gene. And just this month, it's coming out in French. About half of that. <laughs> and, uh, okay, well, that's, that's it. So, um, uh, the, uh, I guess I should summarize the predictions. So the, pr the predictions are, first of all, from the early part of the paper, from the analysis of the, um, of the principal agent model itself, that I predict that if uh, the animals can't, if the animals are locked into a Nash equilibrium, then we would ex not expect to find any nuptial gifts, and the courtship feeding should be only partially reimbursed by the female. Conversely, if it turns out that they do have the capability of uh, reaching the efficient frontier there, perhaps by the mechanism of shared physical intimacy that I'm talking about, but, but whatever mechanism they use, if they can get to something like the Nash bargaining solution, then we should definitely have pretty big nuptial gifts 
just about all the female gets from the male should come from the nuptial gift. And what the male gets from the courtship feeding should basically be reimbursed. So the male should be fully reimbursed for his courtship feed in terms of uh, extra offspring produced or in terms of access to mates. And then finally, from the divorce uh, argument, I would predict that we would have much more divorces when the, uh, in times of high mortality, uh, because uh, if the uh, probability of living uh, from one generation to the next is low, then it's certainly going to be lower than the threshold. And so in cases of high mortality, the probability of living from one interval to the next would be lower than these thresholds, so you would then get divorces. And that's in fact observed, at least we get more data on that. So thank you very much for the opportunity to go over this. <laughs> oh, it's of some interest. <laughs> Yeah, I have some questions. Uh, in large part, you know, because I don't know anything about the evolutionary uh, behavior economics. But actually, it, I, I have this, uh, or, I mean, all kinds of questions first of all, whether uh, an insect or a bird actually make, I mean, make a decision or they actually choose something, whether that's actually different from individual behavior, whether they have options for it, whether they can sacrifice, whether they can actually engage in strategic behavior, whether uh, they can actually repeat the game, you know, what's the difference between this individual behavior versus insects versus birds? So can you actually, can we apply all this game theory, which uh, you know, is, uh, has been developed uh, from yeah. the individual people's, humans' behavior yes. to insects' behavior? I just, uh, <laughs> whether they can actually, you know, commit suicide, for example, you know, these are all the philosophers, the right questions. Um, <laughs> <just> <laughs> Well, yes. But they, they negotiate. You said negotiate. They have options, right? So yeah. many things. Well, the ex you know the cognitive capabilities of animals is uh, not completely known. One might even say not even well, not well known at all. But some things are clear. First of all, we've been underestimating the cognitive abilities of animals all the time. If we always you know, ever since I've been, been a student, you know, decades ago, we thought animals couldn't do anything. Could they're just robots, mindless robots, programmed much like your your re, like a reflex, and and uh, and that all an animal does is carry out a stimulus response, such as you know when you hit your knee with a little rubber hammer, and then your your leg jumps. That would be a, a reflex response. In the early thinking, in the in the 60s, or early 70s, I blush to say, was that that's all an animal's doing. There's a stimulus, and a response is automatically generated. And then in the 60s and 70s, throughout the 70s, it became clear that they are making decisions of many sorts. And one of the biggest areas where the decision making was first looked at involved finding food. And this is the subject, the whole area of optimal foraging theory. And it's had a lot, and it was worked on by Robert MacArthur, especially in the 50s and 60s. And, and in my lab, we, did, we worked with this as well. We worked with optimal foraging of little lizards, the uh, Nolus lizards, little green lizards that you see around here. These lizards are native in the Caribbean, and that's where we were working. And we developed a model in which, and, and for these optimal foraging models, they're getting to be quite realistic in that you, you, you fine tune the model for the species you're looking at. You don't have a generic model of the sort I just gave here. And so lizards live, these green lizards live on trees, and they're they are so-called sit and wait predators. So they sit on a tree and they scan the, the area in front of them. And um, you can compute from these, op from these optimal strategy models that a, a lizard should take a, a, a bug of a given size 
up to a, a cutoff distance. And then beyond that cutoff distance, it should, should ignore the bug. And the cutoff distance is a formula that you can compute from the insect abundance in the field. And, uh, <coughs> and it's different for each size. And the upshot of it is, is that if the, the qualitatively, if there aren't many insects there, the cutoff distance is really far away, and the lizard should go very far. And if the cutoff distance, and if the, there are a lot of bugs, the lizard shouldn't be willing to go as far. Now what you could do in the habitat is you can increase the number of lizards, uh, number of insects in the habitat. You do that either by watering the habitat, which causes more insects to appear, or you can actually provide uh, insects. Now, now, now you can test whether or not there, first of all, is a cutoff limit by seeing, by giving bugs at different distances. And you, and you could establish there actually was a cutoff distance. It wouldn't, it wasn't, the lizard isn't inconsistent. It doesn't sometimes go out there, but then ignore one up here. It would always take anything up to a certain distance and then ignore everything beyond that distance. But that distance that you could measure empirically, you could make that distance itself change by varying how many bugs were in the habitat. So if you water the habitat, so if there are a lot of bugs around, then by golly, the cutoff distance does shrink. And it does this in a day. And then if you, gradually the effect of watering the habitat d disappears, and then the bugs uh, revert to the former level, and then the cutoff distance goes back out. And that was just what we did in my lab. And there were lots, lots of studies. There must be on the order of 50 or more studies now, specifically in the far, on the problem of optimal foraging. So biologists now are, I would say, unanimous that there is a capability of decision making, of even rational decision making in, in animals when it comes to matters like energy and food and so on. So where, where this differs from the work so far is that I'm taking that same paradigm of adaptive decision making and bringing it into a social context and saying that within the social context, they're making decisions as well, and that we can see the outcome of social organization by looking at, um, but instead of having optimization models, having game theoretic models, where you have basically multiple parties simultaneously optimizing. So what's controversial about the work I'm doing here is not the question of whether animals have cognitive abilities to make strategic decisions. It's um, what they're deciding for. And above all, what's controversial, probably controversial about this is my claim that, that they can attain solution concepts, attain solutions that are other than the Nash competitive equilibrium. Because even though biologists would acknowledge that animals can make decisions, they do assume that the basis for all those decisions is one of conflict. You know, the, the male is fighting against the female. In fact, John McNamara, uh, who also has worked on this, uses a great phrase. Each party in a male-female relation is trying to get the other to do all of the work. That's what he says. Now, that's a very cynical view of the world. The question is, it, it might be true, okay? It might be, but, it, but it might not be true. And the point I've, and of course you'll never find out if it's not true, if the only solution concept you have is the Nash equilibrium. But if you're willing to say, well, well, maybe, there are, maybe they're at a Nash bargaining solution. Well, maybe, maybe they are. How could they ever get there? Well, maybe there are mechanisms of negotiation of some sort which would take them to a bargaining solution. So that's the part of this that's controversial. Just one reason. Yeah. Any difference between, I mean, the behavior based on their basic instinct versus the rationality. So for example, suppose that, you know, uh -huh. because uh, you actually said they actually they can move to the frontier, right? Yeah. So suppose uh, I mean, you already assumed that actually there is an evolution, right? So they yeah. can reach. But suppose their behavior never, I mean, um, as, uh, yeah. based, based on their instinct, not the rationality. Yeah, but their instinct is an evolved trait. And so that's, that's how they get their, quote, rationality is they, they evolve tastes and cognitive abilities which will predispose them to these kinds of decisions. 
and to being able to make these kinds of decisions. So I mean, if a group, because of its dis social decision-making ability, produces more young than another group, which has lousy social decision-making capabilities, who's going to evolve? The, off the descendants of the group with the good decision-making capabilities. And, and therefore, it'll look rational if you were going to go in there uh, like a human and, and anthropomorphize the animals, but you don't need to anthropomorphize them. They're just being efficient because that's the way to get the most number of offspring. And, they, and through their instincts, they're making rational-like decisions. But they have nerves just like we do. And, and so it'll come down to the same kinds of physiological mechanisms underlying their, whatever their cognitive instincts are. Yeah. I would just want to ask, I guess, more basic questions about, because um, the, the, well, the biology is new to me, of course. Yeah. Uh, but um, what triggers a divorce, typically? I mean, and, and, and what's the nature of the decisions that are being made? The natural gifts must vary in size and in yeah. quality. And does this signal something about the quality of the partnership? Um, so, so what sort of information is transpiring over time that would, that would, that would trigger different decisions on the part of these, these, these partners? Um, I don't know. I've read papers on this which try to explore this. So one good candidate hypothesis would be that uh, a party, a male or the female, would, would divorce their partner if um, they have a history of not being able to make young effectively together, uh, or if the eggs fail or something. But that turns out not always to be the case, and sometimes their divorces between partners that did raise a su successful nest of eggs the preceding year. And so that hypothesis hasn't been compelling. Another hypothesis is the, tra the genetic trade-up idea, that a female in particular who might see, uh, might uh, divorce the partner that she's with to get a better partner a genetically better partner. But again, the data for this are pretty non-existent because in one of the papers out of my lab, with, again, with, again with Eralache, was that um, we looked into, we did a meta-analysis of the viability and, ca and capability of offspring from, offspring sired by the pair mate, that is, a female sires some offspring by the male she's in the nest with. She sires other offspring with males of adjacent nests. So these would be cases of possible genetic trade-up where she. But there's no evidence that the male, that the offspring from other males are any better than the offspring from the male you're paired with. So I suggested instead that this was a bet spreading strategy instead. It had nothing to do with genetic upgrades. It had to do with literally not having all your eggs in one basket. So if you, um, because, you know, thunderstorms and things can knock an egg, a nest down, so they need to sort of distribute. And so I, that's a long way of saying I don't really know what precipitates a divorce. Um, and and just recently, we, I was I'm in lo looking into the the Laysan albatrosses here in Hawaii, in hopes of maybe getting a study going with them. And there's a very interesting case of uh, a Laysan albatross pair in Princeville, in Kauai, which is studied by people who live right there as like a hobby. And there it was, uh, a pair that had mated for for years, and they li they live a long time. That they have a long lasting pair bond broke up, the egg they had together didn't never hatch because it wasn't being incubated. That was that. And all the observers were saying, this guy is a real cad. <laughs> <laughs> but, he, but there was a completely inexplicable divorce between birds. So there, therefore, we need a theory for this. I mean, it's not as though the, you can go out and just take data without a model. 
in my view. And I, that's what's happening in that field, is they're saying, well, maybe if we just look at enough of them, it'll emerge as to why they divorce. And maybe if we just look at enough cases, you know, it'll jump out at us. And it's, these phenomena seem complicated enough that it's only in light of a model where you can see how the different factors could influence the outcome. That you could even, that you could even hope to design an observational protocol which would let you get at all the parts. Yeah, yeah. It seemed like you were insinuating um, when you were talking about the forest and you were talking about the short-lived, yeah. uh, especially short-lived forest birds, yeah. that they have a higher rate of divorce. And it seemed like you were also talking about how the animals have a lot of uh, like preening and touching, yeah. and, it, and they can sense the animal's welfare. Yeah. Do you think that um, it seemed like you were suggesting that potentially with the short-lived birds, if they and I was sort of making the next step there, if they if they sense that the welfare of their partner is low, and so the potential yeah. for them to continue bringing resources and to help raising the chick or yeah, whatever right. would be low, that they would um, tell. They would they would be able to tell, and yeah. they would divorce quicker. Whereas a long-lived bird like an albatross that's going to be yeah. year after year after yeah. year would be potentially more willing to be like, oh, you know, maybe, yeah. you know, we, we'll keep going with this and see if you feel better tomorrow or, you know, yeah. whatever. <laughs> well, I, I think you're right. I, I'd love to know. Um, um, but, but this would, and, and this is knowable, this is, you know, some, a nice array of movie cameras aimed at nests and so mm -hmm. on could, to get some information on that. I wasn't sure if you were if you were actually suggesting that or not. I don't know if I did, but right. I think okay. I'm consistent. It's consistent right. with what I'd, I'd like okay. to say. Yeah. Do I have somebody over here too? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, go for it. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to kind of follow up with that. I, I, in, in economics, there's a kind of a new behavioral economics these days that yeah. brings in things that are non kind of economic. Benefits yeah. into preferences and folding it into yeah. to game theoretic models. Um, they, they tend to shy away, at least in some cases that I've seen, away from evolutionary stories, but I think they, they fit quite well with they evolutionary do. stories. Yes, they do. Yeah. That, 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 that would be the higher level uh -huh. sort of payoff that's genetically wired. We have a, uh -huh. a taste for intimacy. Yes, yes. Okay? Yes. And there's no maybe uh, fitness. Pay off for that, yeah. But indirectly, there is because it causes cooperative behavior. Uh -huh. So there can be uh -huh. indirect. So it's, it seems like that could be a way of folding in some of these, uh, you know, could, could, could intimacy, a taste for intimacy, be a way of creating cooperation that that is uh, socially beneficial. Um, those sorts of concepts, I think, you know, I don't see that in your model. No. But um, I, I wonder if that's a way of, of folding in these social aspects that create cooperative behavior into, into these models. I just kind of throw that out there as a Yeah, I, I guess what I can say to that is I, I know my own um, um, engagement with psychology is. Uh, Un unclear, and, and that maybe for for many biologists as well. Um, what what we see on the one hand is uh, traditional psychology, um, or um, and especially Freudian psychology. We don't really know what to make of that. We don't really buy it. And, and then you have evolutionary psychology. And in principle, I think mo most, or maybe even all, evolutionary biologists would like to endorse evolutionary psychology. It would be nice to have an evolutionary theory of behavior and an evolutionary rationale for why behavior occurs. But the way these folks do it is, you, is untenable most of the time. And so there are a huge, there's a huge number of a huge amount of criticism of evolutionary psychology coming from evolutionary biologists. Some of it really um, vicious. Some, some, some of it really strident. Um, uh, Jerry Coyne at Chicago, a geneticist with whom I disagree on many things, but is notable for the viciousness with which he attacks anybody. 
<laughs> and uh, <laughs> I've seen, been on the receiving end on some matters myself. And, but he really goes after evolutionary psychologists, and like their evolutionary theory of rape and so on, is just embarrassing. And so we try to keep the evolutionary psychologists at arm's length. And is there a better way of doing it, though? Is there? Well, yeah. First of all, they they ought to be informed. Uh, I mean, it's it comes down to that. It's like where are they? Haven't tried to read anything. It's, it's just <laughs> it's just amazing. Where are you like? How are these guys getting their salary? You know, they don't understand, they don't understand it. Lots of times, how they get away with this, and and they fabricate ideas like the ancient um, evolutionary environment. You know, the pre pre Pleistocene environment in which human traits are supposed to have evolved. But then that, of course, is unspecified and completely unmeasurable. And they don't seem to realize that in evolutionary biology, in principle, statements statements that we make are testable and are tested, and, some, and it takes a lot of work to test them. But if you make an adaptive story about, you know, the animals do this for reason X, if it's a biologist who did it, eventually they could, be, they would, could have to cache that statement into an experiment. You could have to show that if they didn't do X, they would leave less offspring, or if they did Y, and if you show that if they did Y and they left more offspring than if they did X, then you're wrong, and you falsify that hypothesis. And so, you know, the thing about optimal foraging models, actually, is they can be made very exact. You can s really specify what it is the animal should do. And with that, you can find out to a very high degree of resolution whether or not those optimization models are accurate. And that's evolutionary biology. That's not evolutionary psychology. They don't sit there and predict what you should actually do. They tell you a story after the fact. And, uh, and so we, we go ballistic over that. Well, let me... What I'm suggesting is something that might make this a little bit yeah. more rigorous, right? Yeah. I mean, if, say, you had a case for intimacy, what yeah. would be the optimal case for, for intimacy in a competitive environment, well, maybe yeah. a, a Collins yeah. problem, right? Where if people don't have this, 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 this sort of yeah. preference, you're going to get a dismal outcome because, yeah. Uh, yeah. because of the, the competitive intentions. But you can solve this with some sort of psychological mechanism on people's tastes. Uh, yeah. So, so what would be the optimal sort of taste yes. for, 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 from an evolutionary standpoint? And that would yes. presumably be something that you could solve for. You could solve test. for and test, yes. Uh, so that would be great. What, I <laughs> but I'm just making this stuff up. Yeah. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> but, but I haven't seen that kind of thing, and I also, my sense yeah. from some offhand comments that the economists that do this stuff, they don't want to go there. They don't want to test it, do they? Yeah. They, they, they don't want to, yeah. they want to take the preferences, the psychological preferences that he's given, and then solve the games without thinking about whether those preferences, whether the preferences make evolutionary make sense. standpoint. And applying that in biology seems a little bit safer for them. Yeah. But I don't know if that's... If that's interesting. I mean, they ought to give an evolutionary rationale for the preferences. Yeah, that's yeah. and that would, I think, make uh, a, uh, a behavioral economics firmer. Yeah, I would think so, yeah. too. Yeah. I would think so, too. Yeah. But I have, it's for some reason, they don't want to yeah. cut you. Yeah, so I have a, a more classical economics question. So you yeah. have your model, right, you, and you have your prediction on the picture of the non-cooperative mass solution and then the efficient bargaining solution. And then you effectively say, and it's an empirical question, which one we have. Yes. It, so it's hard to say. Well, one, one thing you could say that because these gifts exist and they shouldn't be uh, just they at that yeah. point, that <coughs> does an argument towards, and some yeah. argument towards efficiency. No, I agree with you. I've been hesitant to assert that, but that does follow. And yeah. then I wanted to suggest what an economist would do in a situation where you can't exactly uh, test the quantitative predictions, but yeah. you could do the qualitative tests is say, okay, we may vary the parameters so that in one case there will be a movement towards less feed and yeah, more gifts, yeah. and another parameters right. where you would have more feed and less yeah, gifts, yeah, right. 
according to, say, efficiency, but not according to the threat point. Yes. And then you could look out for qualitative, at least qualitative yes. support in the different societies of animals where yeah. the, you have support for this, and that would give you at least yes. not the exact controlled experiment, but at least the, um, the indirect evidence that right. qualitatively your model, your efficiency prediction fits better in terms of the direction of change of the outcomes. Right. Yeah, we would do that too. Yeah. Um, and that's that or would not. be the way to test or it. Not. Yeah, right. Yeah. That would be the way to test it and uh, to, to develop an experimental system in which you could tune some of these coefficients here, mm -hmm. for example. And that would in turn shift this in different directions and we could, uh, we could definitely do that. And that's the kind of test we did with the optimal right. foraging Actually. theory. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and so I think you're kind of doing this with your divorce story. Yeah. Because your divorce prediction no, is yes, the right. longer you expect to live, the yeah. less divorces you yeah. should see. And yes. you are yeah. seeing here's just yeah. the empirical evidence for yeah, this. So you could probably do it with the gifts and the feeding as well. Yes, and I'd have to get uh, entomologists and ornithologists to buy into my use of nuptial gift and courtship. My, my original. Um, we we'll go back over here. Whoa. I, I need to get buy into this separation here. Say where there's uh, compensation for C but not for N. I need, need to get them buy. I would need to get buy in on that uh, before they would test it. You know, they, they wouldn't say, I'm, I'm not a. I haven't. I don't know yet whether this equation models the phenomenon that I think it's modeling, and and I would need the workers on that to sort of reconfirm that. I, I think it is, but it's not peer reviewed yet, so mm -hmm. I, I don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want to ask something about yeah. diversification. Your don't put all your eggs in one basket. Yeah. So in agriculture, sometimes we see diversification. So you grow different crops, and the reason is not anything about covariance, which is the standard yeah. theory of reducing the cost of risk, but it's about if I get one state of the world low rainfall or one state of the world high rainfall, then one of these crops is going to be more worthwhile to pursue. So I'm going to put more of my energy, I don't know in advance, yeah. where I'm going to put my energy. So, could that be the same thing with birds? Uh, well, I guess. I mean, the hypothesis I was putting out was that there was no difference in quality. There was just difference in the realization of risk. So that, um, so, so that if, if that was a bird's nest, and so there, if there was a bird's nest in each corner of the table, um, and one in the middle, then the part, then the pair in the middle would also, sh so the females could actually dump egg, bring, bring an egg that she laid and put it in another nest. That's egg dumping. And then conversely, the, 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 when this male was gone, this male could come over here and mate with her, or she could actually go over to that nest and mate with him. So you wind up getting the paternity and the, the maternity both such that the eggs in this nest typically would have, well, it depends on the species, but maybe 10% of them would have been sired by an adjacent male, and maybe 5% would be eggs that come from an adjacent female. So if you then assume that the same is true for every nest, so this one is sharing with that, this one is sharing with that, and so on, that, that then when the lightning storm comes, some trees are hit by lightning and the nest is lost. So that's the picture I had, is that there was literal, there's a realization of risk, a spatially distributed realization of the risk. And, but there's no quality, that's not a better nest than that one. So they're not trying to uh, go to a nest in hopes that this would be a better one. But, but what you're saying is that that could be true too. This could be the nest that 
got lots of sunlight, and this could be the nest that was in the shade and got eaten by bot flies, <laughs> you know. And so there could actually be a quality difference, not just a random hazard just difference. Um, and so e e either arguments, I think, would... Yeah, I was fishing yeah, for something yeah. that after the realization of risk, the lightning or whatever, yeah. then there would be a change in effort somehow. Well, at the beginning of the season, yeah, they wouldn't know because the, the mating is going on at the beginning of the season. And if, if by then it was clear, if at the beginning it was clear that some nests were bad, then the nest, the birds who nested there would leave. I, th I think, uh, if there's anything, unless there's no place to go. I didn't have a comment on yeah. rationality. That in economics we're kind of, I mean, in, I guess historically, we think as if people have cognitive abilities to calculate, they behave as if they have cognitive abilities to calculate benefits and costs, yeah. and they act accordingly, whereas more and more the neuroscience and behavioral yeah. economics is suggesting that there is something more like what I call before institutions, rules of thumb, customs, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, intimacy, rituals. Uh -huh. So it's these things that have evolved that are determining behavior. Yeah. And that, that then is quite consistent with, with our animal nature. Right. So <laughs> yeah. it's not that... Yeah. Actually, you yeah. yeah. question. So, yeah. doesn't that really like a theory of, I mean, boundary behavior? Yeah. You know, like this, I mean, because right now you are assuming that agents are perfectly rational. Yeah, it's right? undone, yeah. I mean, the evolution essentially made them rational, right? Yeah. yeah. But, you see, the problem is, okay, let's suppose they're not perfectly rational. Do we, do we assume they're very dumb and then gradually allow them? I mean, do this yeah. or what? Yeah, yeah, but, gradually, yeah. yeah, so the question is, where do you come in from? I mean, if this is perfectly rational and this is uh, mindless, <laughs> um, and if the middle, and if where they actually are is somewhere in the middle, do you, what, what we've done in the past is assume they're mindless and then gra grudgingly acknowledge they're smarter than we thought, and the alternative tactic is to say, okay, they're really smart, and let's just acknowledge every now and then when they're not as smart as we thought they were. Um, and I tend to come in from this side, and the traditionally, of course, the Skinner box people and some come in from that side. But, it, but yes, we need a theory of bounded rationality at some point. Oh, you guys really know this. <laughs> <laughs>